Blog Talk Radio. Hello and welcome to Psyched Up Radio. This is your host, Carla Lundblade. In the world of professional sports, mental skills and mental strategies can lead to maximum performance. But in the world of celebrity, be it sports or any form of celebrity, maintaining a career over a lifetime is something that does not come by chance. At Psyched Up Radio, we bring you experts who are willing to share not just their tips and guidance, but secrets to success that really work at any point in the game of life. I am so psyched to introduce to you today's guest, Dr. Gregory A. Smith. Welcome, Greg. Hi. How you guys? How you doing today? I'm doing great. How are you? I'm doing good. Oh, well, good. Well, I know you and I are going to have a race for humble pie here because I know that the work you do is so important to you and also the introduction that I get from my guests about what they're doing in life, where they're at, uh, I think are the most valuable. So, Greg, I'm going to ask you to tell us about you. Well, about me, I, I tell you, it's uh, there's, a, there's a lot of me's, but I think um, – What's been consistent in my life is always wanting to help people in one way or another. I know when I was a, a young child, I, I used to see my dad working on old, our old cars, and, and I was always concerned about what would, hap- what would happen if people or people I care about broke down or had a problem. That was really why I wanted to become a doctor. And then I really hate to see people suffer, and that's why I went into pain management, chronic pain management. And then as that went along, I saw the big, big problem, the enormous epidemic we have in this country of people addicted to uh, prescription uh, narcotics and just prescription pills in general. And so really for the last 10 years of my life has really been um, really been devoted to uh, helping people get off these, these medications, breaking their addictions, and you know, coming up with unique ways to do that. And as you know, uh, producing the film American Addict, uh, to really, really outline why we have become, unfortunately, a nation of, of addicts. You know, initially, at first blush, that would seem like a pretty strong statement. So take me back to the moment when you decided that a movie project about what you saw within your practice, why you thought that that would be a great avenue to get information out to the public. Well, I, I started writing a book called American Addict probably about three, four years ago, and one of the statistics that came up to me that really made me feel like I had to do something more on a national or even international level was uh, well, there's two things. First, I saw how many people were not getting better uh, having chronic pain and was just becoming more and more dependent on these medications. And then the second thing was the statistic that I, that I, that I read was that we're about 5% of the world's population, but we're consuming over 80, some people even say up to 90% of the world's prescription uh, narcotics and 50% of the world's prescription medication in general, which is, just, which is phenomenal. And so this can't be just out of happenstance. There has to be reasons for this, and that's sort of what the investiga- how the investigation uh, started. Like, why is this happening? Absolutely. You know, I think, you know, where we see uh, problems like this uh, probably most often is in the headlines. And I know both you and I uh, do work with celebrities and, you know, I work with professional athletes. And unfortunately, drug addiction, recovery, these are very common situations that you and I see in both of our practices. Can you talk about... um, you know, what it's like for somebody in the public eye, especially, who maybe starts realizing that this may be a problem, or maybe their family member starts realizing this is a problem. Can you talk about what that's like for families in the public eye? Well, it's difficult for anybody, um, and it's often difficult to feel sort of sorry for some for celebrities because they seem to have a lot of money, they have fame, but sometimes those things can be a, a curse. Uh, when you are a public figure, then everything that you do is amplified. Uh, people, the paparazzi following you around, there's really a, a difficult, especially if you're very famous, it's difficult to have any privacy. So 
dealing with a problem this personal, this of this magnitude, is is just worsened by the fact that it's hard to be private. So, um, and that that goes for checking themselves in the inpatient facilities, going to clinics, etc. There's always people watching, and this is how we basically started doing a home program where everything is done in the person's home, and not only can you have uh, the IV protocols to help people get off uh, narcotics and other prescription pills, but whether it's uh, psychi psychology, medical hypnotherapy, Reiki, healing, uh, nutrition, whatever, all is brought into the, uh, the high-profile person's home. Uh, so there's the ultimate in privacy, and in addition, it actually reels in the other family members, because that's another problem is that often the family members don't understand what's going on themselves. And when they're involved in the process, the outcome is much, much better than what you see in many of the uh, inpatient programs or the traditional 12-step uh, type programs, which have, you know, unfortunately have a very high failure rate. Yeah, I, I, that I understand not only on a professional level but a personal level. And, you know, personally for me and my family, I've actually been involved in three interventions. And I can say from personal experience that it is the most emotional time in a family and it's probably the least logical. What are some of the benefits that you see for in-home treatment um, that your program provides, especially not only for the person that is you know, entering recovery and beginning their own recovery, but also for their family members? Well, I've always been in favor of people uh, undergoing narcotic or detoxification in general, uh, either as an outpatient or at home, because you're basically going through the process in real time in your own environment. And and when we talk about what causes addiction in the first place, one of the big ones is environment. And people have to it, – it's really easy to go away to Malibu or some, you know, resort and, and eat organic food and lay out by the beach and feel great um, and detox. But the problem is you have to come back to reality and go back home, deal with your family, the friends, your, your whole environment, and then sometimes that's where the wheels come off. So by doing it in their own environment – they learn to cope at the same time. And I can't stress the importance of, of having the family involved because it's a support system and it's also making them really understand the problem because it's hard to understand why people do what they do. One of the biggest issues, especially when I deal with younger people, teenagers, um, or young adults, the, the parents are just like, why can't they just stop? They, can't they see how destructive this is? Well, they can see how destructive it is, but they just – People just can't stop. It's not something they can just turn on or turn off, or they wouldn't do it logically. So having the having the parents or the the, the family involved is, is is huge. When you look at the other types of approaches, the twelve step uh, approach and this type of thing, um, there's some there's obviously value to that. It's been around forever. I think when people have zero support system, that those can help. But unfortunately. You know, their own numbers show that they have around a 90 to 95 percent failure rate, which is huge. And I mean, this is sort of where this phrase, relapse is part of recovery, has come into play. And I don't know about you, but if I have cancer or some other thing, I don't want the doctor telling me relapse is part of recovery. I want to go Absolutely. through it and get well and never have to go through it again. So that's why I think this makes a huge difference because I don't want people to relapse. I think that it should be. You go in, you have treatment, you get better, and you go on with your life. You don't keep relapsing every, you know, so many months or years. Absolutely, and that's kind of a, you know, that, that's a pretty modern way to look at it. And we're going to talk about the science that actually backs up what you're saying there about new ways, different ways, and better ways to really deal with detox, <clears throat> excuse me, and life after you know, you know what I see with athletes, especially teen athletes at the college level and even younger, is oftentimes I get the information about what they are doing behind the scenes that their coaches don't know about and their parents don't know about. And oftentimes alcohol and drug use are happening for teens. And um, 
I, I think a lot of people think that teens, teens are doing this recreationally. This is part of partying. But especially with athletes who have dreams of the future, the single biggest reason that they may be doing this in their life is to deal with the enormous stress. Right. So right. talk to me about what you're seeing with teen addiction and then maybe where it's transitioning into prescription drugs and how that's affecting our teens. Well, the biggest, the biggest thing that I hear from, from teenagers that have a problem with, uh, with drugs, and, 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 and by far Xanax and OxyContin are the, are the two biggies, is boredom. A lot of times they, they, they say, I was just bored. Um, so it's, uh, it's a way to get rid of boredom because they're unhappy with other things. And it's also a coping mechanism, peer pressure, the stress of trying to achieve. There's a, there's a lot of stress. On, on young people right now just to achieve to get into college, let alone to play uh, in college or even professional sports. So what we have to understand is when we look at the reasons for addiction, I mean, there's really three main things the way I look at it. There's DNA involved, which people say, well, if, you're, you know, if your parents were a drinker, maybe you'll be a drinker. But there's definitely some, there's definitely some uh, science behind that. There's environment, and there's really uh, coping mechanisms dopamine reward system and state change, and this is all one category. So in other words, when we take a, a pill or we go to happy hour, I mean, that's the, the biggest, the most common example. I mean, it's alcohol is legal, people go to happy hour, and when you go there, they are happy, and they're happy because they're drinking, and when you drink, it immediately gets into your blood system, goes into your brain, and it makes people feel better. So there's what's called a state change, and this is due to the dopamine reward system. The dopamine reward system happens in the brain where the, the uh, medication, the alcohol, whatever, stimulates dopamine to uh, be released in the brain, and at that point, uh, people feel better. And there's a lot of things that stimulate it. Well, interestingly, uh, cigarette smoking stimulates it at a very high level, so you will often see people that have addiction problems uh, end up smoking cigarettes a lot become chain smokers because they can't take the, the drug all at the same time. So I know that was a long-winded answer, but to, to answer your question specifically with teens, it's mainly uh, boredom, also coping mechanisms, and the change of their state. That's the, the main reason I see them take the, uh, the medications. No, that that is a great answer. And, you know, when you start talking about DNA and dopamine, can you talk about basically, because I know, I know parents, this is what I hear from parents, and it is exactly what it is you're talking about where, you know, why can't they just stop or, or you know, and then parents are doing certain things that are unfortunately actually promoting the problem and enabling yeah. the problem. Um, you know, I work on an early intervention plan because a lot of times parents aren't even getting involved in until the addiction, they've known it for years, and now it's completely interfering, and it's only at that point that they're looking at detox and recovery. And I would really like to see a lot more information at the front end that parents are definitely armed with to help be proactive and not reactive. Um, can you yeah. talk a little bit about the DNA? Because the part that I find the most fascinating is you can test for predictability about addiction is that right. true that's true and 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 i and after we talk about this i really want to go back to your point you talking about a uh, parent enabling that's a big topic but the Good. dna is a very very interesting thing um just like when you watch uh you know csi or whatever on tv shows where they're doing forensic dna analysis to catch you know criminals um you can do dna testing it's a very simple test it's done in a in some doctor's offices, and you have to go to specific places to get it done. But you swipe the inside of the, the cheek, uh, send it off to one-time test, and you get a profile back that really accurately predicts. It's not a crystal ball, but it accurately predicts who's predisposed to having a problem with drugs, alcohol, obesity, anxiety, depression, et cetera, et cetera. And interestingly, interestingly the, most, the, the people that have more and more uh, uh, things positive in addition to having a problem with addiction are more likely to be harder core addicts than those that don't have those. So in other words, if, if you have the genetic profile that's consistent with addiction and you also have the profile that's consistent with anxiety and depression, right. that is worse than just addiction alone. So when you see this, 
it gives you um, it gives you information on why some people and you hear this all the time where a person will go to the dentist and get a get some Vicodin and they take a pill and it makes them sick or they take one or two and after a day they put the bottle away and never touch it again. You have another person that takes Vicodin or Oxycontin or Xanax or some medication and it's like the, a light switch just gets flipped in their brain and it's the greatest feeling they've ever had and they're ushered into addiction because it makes them feel good. And this is one of the reasons, or this is the, one of the main reasons why this happens, is this predis predisposition to be uh, addicted to uh, prescription or, or just in, in, in general addiction, whether that's alcohol, heroin, or prescription pills. Wow. You know, what a thing to know, uh, you know, going into a situation and knowing that there's some scientific confirmation and, you know, some proactive knowledge you can actually know ahead of time to, you know, hopefully make different decisions. Now, let's talk about parent, parents and let's talk about enabling and what are some of the things that you see that you find um, that you would like to see the most change in? Well, you bring up a great point about enabling, and I see this a lot when there's two parents in the home. It's almost always the mother that's enabling, especially if it's a if it's a male child or a son. And what happens is you get a dynamic where the father normally gets fed up and just wants to put the kid on the streets, and the mother that will go to extreme measures. I've had mothers that will move out. They'll actually leave their husbands and move out into uh, motel rooms or apartments with their with their sons just to keep protecting them. I've had I've seen mothers give money, uh, go buy the drugs for their child, etc. Because they don't know what else to do. They just know when their child is not having the heroin or the oxycontin that they're what's what, what's called commonly called dope sick. They don't want them to be dope sick, so they'll enable them. They'll also give them multiple chances that the, the son or the the, sibling or the uh, child will say, oh, I've stopped, I'm better now, and, and, uh, and everything's going to be fine. Yeah. And they'll believe them. And what happens is the child just gets better at hiding what they're doing. It's not that they're necessarily better. So enabling is a huge, huge problem. What would you say to parents who um, are finding some things or smelling some things or are at the very beginnings of being concerned? Well, they have you have to be an investigator when you're with your parent. <laughs> I mean, I've done that my own. Uh, well, my older son, my younger son's only five, so I don't, hopefully I'm going to investigate him at this point. But, <laughs> but um, you have to be involved. I mean, you know, you don't always have to be a friend to your child. You have to be a parent first, in my opinion. So I don't have a problem with going in, in their bedroom when they're in school and and just checking out to see if there's some. If, if that's if you suspect something. I don't think uh, if your child is having absolutely no uh, and giving you no reason for that, I wouldn't have to snoop around. But you just have to keep your eyes open. And I think educating the, the child, demystifying it, that was the thing that I did for my older son when uh, when he was 11, 12 years old. I started demystifying things like drugs, sex, alcohol, all that. And I remember one time he was shocked when I told him, I said, you know what, when you go to high school, you're probably going to end up trying marijuana it's so common he was looking at me like I was insane I'm like no it's just so common <laughs> that that I would be surprised if you didn't try it but the difference is you you want to be that guy that can laugh about it 20 years later that you you smoked some uh, some marijuana in high school and not the guy that's a stoner sitting on his couch 20 years from now so that's the difference when yeah, I think when absolutely. people try and scare children and don't do it and don't do it it's just like that experiment. If you get a group of kids together and say, I'm le getting ready to leave, and you can touch anything in the kitchen except for that big purple jar over there, don't open that, what's the first <laughs> thing you're going to do when you leave the room? They're going to go for that purple jar. So if you demystify it, I think that makes a big difference for parents. Greg, I know people are going to want to know where to get a hold of you. And um, could you tell people where they can contact you? Well, you know, the, the simplest way is just go to the, our website is painreliefgroup.com. That's the simple, painreliefgroup.com. And, of course, I'm on, you know, I'm all on Facebook and Twitter, although it's pretty new. But, you know, they Google my name, Gregory A. Smith, MD, Facebook. Or I'm, I think my Twitter is pain, uh, Twitter at painmd or something like that. Yeah, that's it. So, <laughs> that's it? Okay, you know, so I'm trying to 
you know, I'm, I'm, I'm really making, as we've talked about, making it more of an effort to do social networking. But the, but the, the website uh, is there. There's contact information. They can email me. At G, I mean, I get a lot of emails, and I, and I answer all of them. It may take me a couple days by answering them. And it's just gsmith at painreliefgroup.com. And, that, and I can answer questions and share information with people. You know, what I like about it, it being painreliefgroup.com, is people think that pain, I think initially they think, oh, physical pain and medications for p physical pain. But you care just as much about the emotional pain that your patients and their families are suffering. So it's all pain. And, and I really, really appreciate that about you. Is you're very approachable, very knowledgeable, and um, it, it's very comforting. And, you know, one of the things you and I have talked about uh, at length is a treatment. You, you put it beautifully. You called it treatment in a vacuum. Could you describe what that means and, and kind of what you're seeing as far as just, you know, average medical treatment or psychological treatment that people are experiencing? Well, it's a function of the way medicine has gone in this country where there's people are given a pill for a problem. You have a headache, here's a pill. You can't sleep, here's a pill. You're having anxiety, here's a pill, et cetera, et cetera. And it's also a function of the subspecialty uh, subspecialists in this country were so compartmentalized. So in other words, you go to the doctor for a reason. They don't ask you what other medications you're on necessarily. They start treating your insomnia. And then this person starts treating your depression. And then this, then the pain doctor is treating your chronic pain. And on and on and on. And the next thing you know, you have all these medications in your system, and it's like the most wicked pot of chili known to man because you're just throwing one ingredient after another in your bloodstream, and the drug interactions are off the Richter scale. It's, it's no matter why people are walking around uh, like zombies. I mean, we're talking about pretty much 50% of the population right now is on at least one prescription medication. That's just phenomenal. So it, there be, what I mean by treating the vacuum is that you don't, people aren't being looked at as a whole person, and they're also right. not being given alternatives to medication. I mean, the first thing I want to do is get people off medication, find out the reason why they can't sleep, why they're having pain, why they're having anxiety, and look at other ways, whether it's deep breathing exercises, yoga, or natural supplements to take the place of, of other pills. I mean, something like 5-HTP, which causes the body to make more serotonin, can be as effective as an antidepressant, uh, and it's natural. Uh, you can get it at uh, Whole Foods or something like that. <laughs> so, but, but instead, people are on Prozac and some of these other medications, which are really uh, can be poisonous. I mean, Prozac especially is not a good drug. So, I mean, I, we, we beat that drug to death in the movie American Addict. So I just think um, <laughs> people are being treated as, as problems instead of, instead of people. And so they're just given pills for problems, and that is what I think is the worst part of our system right now. Uh, medical system. Well, well, you know, it's just <clears throat> excuse me. Even how we describe it, it's disease. You're you're uneasy. You're broke and need to be fixed. You know, so much. Even in my practice, um, we do medical rule outs all the time because right. I really. You know, for me, it's so important to have a comprehensive program of treatment. And what has always blown my mind is how. Um, someone can be prescribed a medication that we knowingly we we know we know it's going to change their personality there's also it might increase suicidal ideation and and have some negative emotional spirals with absolutely right. no psychological support during that time yeah. and exactly. i i just find that uh, incredible. And so I love what you're talking about is that it's comprehensive treatment. And it, it not only uh, brings in the family, it brings in the emotions, it, it brings in research of some really modern ways to deal with, with recovery. Now, you have a lot of amazing projects going on. And I know that the American Addict, um, you, you've had some great success with. Can you, can you talk about where you're at as, as far as where that movie releases? Well, that film, we just uh, signed a distribution deal about two weeks ago, so um, it should have a, a theatrical release in 2013, 
and then you know go the, so the same route of the DVD and the video and demand and all that all that afterwards. So that's a it was a very big accomplishment because you know ninety ninety five percent of independent films rarely get uh, deals or theatrical release. So we're very happy about that. And and as you know, we're working on a new film called Cancer in Wonderland, which yeah. is uh, basically a parable of of cancer treatment. Uh, contrasting uh, alternative treatments. A lot of them have been suppressed by the big pharmaceutical companies because some of them seem to be actually cures for a lot of cancer versus chemotherapy and that type of thing. And that's going to be a fe both feature films. It's going to be a feature film with actors. The American Act Addict was, was mainly documentary. This new one is going to be um, more of a feature film with some documentary into it. Um, but again, it really is uh, entertainment but educating people at the same time, because it's just information that people uh, would not get any other way. Uh, what people have to understand is our whole medical system is really driven heavily by uh, pharmaceutical companies, uh, big money. There's a lot behind this, and, and that's sort of why our medical system and why people are being treated the way they, they are. A lot of the, the, uh, the treatment has been taken out of the doctor's hands, and because of lower reimbursements and doctors having to see more patients and less time to make the same money. This is why all these forces point us in a, a situation where people are just getting a pill for a problem because it's a lot easier to just give someone a pill in one minute for a headache versus to take five or ten minutes to actually ask them questions to find out why they have headaches or why they have low back pain or why they're anxious or depressed. Um, so, again, it, it's a, we, we, are, uh, we have a medical system that has sort of gone the wrong direction right now. It's a, we're the, still the best in the world for acute injuries, heart, you know, you need a heart surgery or things like that. But in terms of preventative medicine, keeping people healthy in the first place, uh, very bad, very bad right now. You know, I have to say I was very honored. You know, one of the first times that I was introduced to your work was you were actually featured as expert commentary in, you know, a very important documentary. Can you talk about that and, you know, what some of the subjects were that you, you were talking about early on? And it really had to do with Michael Jackson's death and the type of, unfortunately, medical care he was receiving. Can you talk about that? Well, you know, Michael Jackson, you know, I grew up listening to his music. It was a very personal thing when he passed away, and uh, obviously it was, it was difficult for, every, for everybody. He was a very well-loved person, one a lifetime musician. And um, I actually did a lot of interviews right after he passed away and a lot, a lot more during the Conrad Murray trial. But there was a documentary called What, what Killed the King of Pop? Um, there's a lot of documentaries about him, but, but I was uh, in that one. It was really taken from an interview that I did for uh, Reuters, which was uh, broadcasted all over the place. It, it ended up, a piece of the interview ended up on programs all over the world, and that was probably, um, I think I did that maybe a few days to a week after he had, he had passed away uh, when we didn't have all the information, but certainly just tragic, and uh, I, I know that whole situation very well, and it, uh, it was something that obviously should never, did not have to happen. And he, you talk about enabling, I mean, he was enabled to the nth degree. It, it's, he had nothing but yes men around him, and the people in his family that seemed like they really did want to help were actually shut away from their own, you know, their own sibling, their own son, et cetera. So just a very, very unfortunate situation, as, as is with Whitney Houston and many others that's passed away in the last few years. You know, that's interesting. And when I go to the research, especially helping young people strategize a professional career that involves stardom and celebrity, there are statistically things that, uh, you know, decisions that have to be made early in the career that will affect that because unfortunately during that process, the people that you are affiliated with business-wise are the ones, unfortunately, that are most incented to uh, care about you the least. 
And if you know that going in, then the relationships you have with a significant other and how you pick a partner, you know, to pair up with in your life, not only is a financial decision and an emotional decision, it is a protective decision in this crazy life, out of control life that is celebrity. And, um, you know, one of the things that almost always happens without conscious forethought and creating your emotional family around celebrity is that the family does get isolated and pushed out. And that is a very dangerous place for any celebrity. That is very, very dangerous. And we see it time and time again. Now, Greg, you've got a lot going on in your practice now. I am so happy that you actually, I was, I was joking with you that you slid sideways into your office chair. <laughs> to make the exactly. Today. Um, what do you see in your future and the future of the practice that, that you've begun? And I know you're being sought out around the world for, for what you're doing and the relief that you are offering and you know, the change of life that you offer for people. Well, that's a that's a, a very big question.